Please welcome Ms. Eric Phillips. Thank you, Professor Ivor Griffith. Batting first or second on this tricky wicket called race, racism, reality, and reconciliation is in itself a slippery slope because this topic is so central to Ghana's growth, yet it's not properly discussed. It's a secret. We're unwilling to discuss it. So I'd like to congratulate the University of Ghana on this initiative. Good evening, everyone. Today's headline in a regional newspaper. Will Ghana's third term CCJ appeal be decided by the race of the judges? Yesterday's review of Black Panther, a lot of negative by non-Africans. Let in today's paper, the evil Granger and the evil PNC, that's why I will vote for Jack Dio in 2020. Facebook, daily negative and abusive racial comments by most groups in Guyana, abusing each other. Race and racism have always been issues in Guyana and across the world. There's nothing new here. Let's stop kidding ourselves. So let's accept this central proven fact that racism is pervasive, and instead of denying and excusing it, let us create solutions that enable us to live our motto of one people, one nation, one destiny. I hope this event is the beginning of a process of finding solutions. If not, with the next elections on the horizon, and with oil at stake, and with a winner take all egregious solution, um, electoral system, we may have problems. There is institutionalized racism in many parts of the world, including Guyana, and there is also individual racism in Guyana. I will argue tonight that the enabling environment for reconciliation is not presently here and needs to be created. It's interesting that we're debating or discussing race, reality, and reconciliation when we just lost Winnie Mandela, who fought a brutal sense and type of racism. And just yesterday, we commemorated Martin Luther King's 50th death anniversary. He fought racism in a country where we were told by Thomas Jefferson Behold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal and that they are endowed by the creator with certain unable level rights. This is our global reality. Racism in Guyana is no different than racism in America or any other place. It's interesting that Paloma, Dr. Paloma Mohammed, spoke about our youth. I note that while young as a child, growing up in Maikone, Dundee, and in Georgetown, and whilst a young person at Queen's College, race and racism never entered our minds. So this must be an adult thing. What is racism? Professor Keen Gibson, who I saw here tonight, defined racism as a political system, a particular power structure of formal and informal rule, socioeconomic privilege and norms for the differential distribution of material wealth and opportunities, benefits, rights and duties. We also know the traditional definition of racism, which is the belief that another race of people is inferior. This attitude results in discrimination, antagonism, domination, individually, politically, economically, and otherwise. To me, racism is both of these definitions. And I'll argue also that racism is the new poverty in Guyana. It is institutionalized in Guyana, in our winner-take-all electoral system. It is institutionalized in our culture. It is institutionalized in our religions. It is institutionalized in our media, 
in our politics and in our history. So why are we so surprised? All of Guyana's uprisings, from slavery to indentorship to the Rupununi uprising, they were all about race and racism. So racism in Guyana is structural, it's institutional. Racism breeds fear, and fear breeds racism. So what is our reality? Here is an editorial from Stabrook News, November 2005 talking about race and racism. We operate in the twilight world of half-truths, quarter-truths, myths, and falsehoods, and the constructs being used to explain the inconvenient portions of reality which poke through the fog are neither grounded in a full appraisal of the facts, nor in a commitment to the truth. Traditionally, we have closed our eyes to any illegality committed by members of our own group, particularly if the perception is that it has contributed to making us feel more secure. I've been asked to provide an analysis of conditions and solutions for race, reality, and reconciliation. So tonight I'll put on an engineer's hat and perhaps say some things that might be uncomfortable, as Professor Griffith has stated. I want to start with our definition of culture, because it's very critical. Do we have a Guyanese culture? Do we have several cultures? Here's the definition I like the most. When we speak of the culture of a place, we're talking about far more than its artistic expressions or its cultural products, literature, music, dance, art, sculpture, theater, film, and sport. All of these are, of course, important expressions of culture of any social group, as it's part of their shared joy in the business of being life. But culture is more than that. Culture is about the relationships between ideas and perspectives, about self-respect and a sense of security, about how individuals are socialized and values are transformed and formed. It's also deeply intertwined with structures of power and wealth. Culture is both dynamic and reactive. It both influences economic and political conditions and is influenced by them. I may get pushed back on this, but my view is that we have a culture of racism in Guyana, when you look at that definition. And there are many reasons, and I'm addressing this cold-bloodedly as an engineer would define a problem. Religion. Some of us are in denial about this. We forget it was the three papal bulls by two popes of the Catholic Church beginning in 1492 that legalized slavery. Today's religions are about separateness while preaching godliness, separation, sin versus sinner, and a hierarchical basis of the Hindu caste system that separates based on color and class. We don't want to speak about this. Religion was a central part of enslavement and the colonization process. Some are taught black is evil from a very early age. This remains in our psychological DNA. Second reason why it's institutionalized. We've come from a history of slavery and indentureship. These are race-based social constructs established by the British and the Dutch. The church and the state, if you were to read your history, created and defined racism to justify Africans were not full humans. So race, racism. The third reason why we have an institutionalized culture of racism in Guyana is the Westminster system, winner take all. This racially divides Guyana, period. It nurtures and rewards Apanjat. It nurtures and rewards voting for Kit and Kin. How can we have a motto of one people, one nation, one destiny, which speaks about unity, which speaks about everyone winning, when our electoral system is about winner take all, meaning someone loses? So electoral system nurtures and institutionalizes racism. The economic stratification of Guyana, which is linked to race and benefits from when you came here and how you came here as different groups, it's created a system and a culture of racism, of privilege, of color differentiation. Fifth reason why we have a culture of racism. Frighteningly, as the report came out last week, 
We have an increasingly uneducated population that encourages and nurtures racial manipulation by politicians. Less than 3% of Guyanese have a degree. We're not an issues-based society. We're a race-based society as seen in our elections. And then, of course, the final reason, final two reasons, we have historical distortions. We have too many untrue historical narratives about our history. We have different truths based on our different races. Guyana's history has been corrupted by omission and falsities. Our historians as well as our politicians have failed us. Our history has been distorted for political gain. And the last reason why we have a culture of racism is our media. We create an atmosphere conducive to nurturing and rewarding racism. We're the only place in the world where you have all these letters to the editors and these blogs that encourage and nurture and reward racism. So these are seven reasons why we are where we are today. We try to camouflage it by saying social cohesion, but there's social cohesion is meaningless without social inclusion. Inclusion. What are the necessary prerequisites for reconciliation? First, we need a true and single taught narrative of our history. No different narratives, no untruths. This will allow us to forge self-esteem, forge self-respect, and cultural racial equity and respect. We need to dispel these racial truths. Just this week, I saw Chetty Jagan as father of the nation. How can this be? The idea that Chetty Jagan is father of the nation is about race. It's not about truth. We had independence in 1966. He became president in 1992. This is a racial and political manipulation that nurtures a culture of racism. So we need history to be taught in the schools as a mandatory topic, true history. The next process or reason or way in which we can have reconciliation is through constitutional reform. This is absolutely necessary. An executive presidency with a list of a winner-take-all arrangement has never worked and will never work. It perpetuates racism. It perpetuates economic disparities. It perpetuates underdevelopment. We badly need electoral reform if we're going to have reconciliation. We also need a society that's based on justice and the rule of law. I cannot and would not go more into this because of the information I've been seeing the last years. We glorify white collar crime and we punish blue collar crime. That's racial. That's a culture of racism. We also need servant leaders. This is a necessary prerequisite if we are to become a fair, just, and inclusive society. Sadly today, many of our leaders across government, private sector, religious organizations in the media are not competent, are not visionary, are not open-minded, are not non-racist or incorruptible. And this is our society. Let's face the truth. So in summary, my seven Guyanese minutes, our key institutions have created a racial culture in Guyana because of our history, our religion, our economic legacies of slavery and indentureship. For Guyana to become a plural democracy, multiracial, multi-ethnic, we need that servant leadership, and we need to face the truth. There's a famous saying by Calvin Gilbrand, we choose our joys and sorrows long before we experience them. If we deny the truth that we have an institutionally designed culture and country, we will not find the solutions and we'll continue to kid ourselves. Thank you.